Uh, okay. All right, you good? Yep. Is there anything in particular you want to discuss? I don't think so. I think I don't think there's really anything specific. Um, I, don't know, I feel like everyone kind of knows like situation, like obviously going through the process with the coronavirus that obviously came out towards mm. the middle of it to where you couldn't do pro days or anything like that. So Okay, we could that's a good reminder. All right. All right, bet. You ready? Yep. All right, smooth. All right. Well, we are here. Agent Talk Podcast. Um, I'm here with a special guest, good friend of mine, one of my one of my clients uh, still kind of feels weird even saying that, but my guy Sterling Hawford, or Sterling is a recent draft pick with the Atlanta Falcons, uh, punter specialist. Uh, definitely has given me a unique experience, my first specialist that I've ever worked with. Uh, so Sterling, one glad to have you here. Off the top, for those you know, somebody that's never heard of you, has no idea who you are. Who is Sterling Hoffrichter? Yeah, so I grew up um, born and raised in Florida. Um, started playing football, I think, when I was about 10 years old, Brandon Bears. So then I went to Armwood High School, um, went there for four years, and then ended up getting a scholarship offer to Syracuse. So I went there for five years after Richard, my freshman year, behind Riley Dixon, who's the punter for the Giants. And then um, did really well up there and Kind of went through the NFL draft process and ended up getting drafted seventh round. What brought you to the sport of football? Like being a, a, a you know a kicker slash punter, it's obviously a little different than all the other positions. Did you have a background of soccer? Like what kind of brought you to the field? I guess. Yeah, so I grew up playing soccer since I was four years old. Um, all my my whole family, we were very athletic we always were playing sports pretty much year round so my biggest sport actually growing up was baseball and that's mm -hmm. what I was going to do was be a baseball player but end up doing um AAU with so travel ball and end up getting burned out from that so then when I was 10 I think my younger brother and I we were like hey we want to play football and uh, my dad went up to like the Brandon Bears because if you're if it's your first year, you have to go register and everything and you have to do it with everyone else. So we actually got like waitlisted, I think. Mm. But then people end up kind of dropping out or whatever. So we ended up playing and I don't know, I love football ever since and yeah. haven't looked back. What made you want to like, we'll kind of fast forward to college. Like what was it about Syracuse that was, this is where I want to be? Yeah, so a lot of things that led to that. So first was they were the first team to offer me. They offered me right after a state championship game my junior year. So I had an offer very, very early. And, you know, it's, it was really kind of shocking to get one, but it was super cool. Then obviously I didn't want to make a decision that far out. You know, I didn't even know anything about the school or anything like that. But then once I kind of visited the school, I want to say in May of that next year, right before my senior year, is the first visit I made, um, and I just kind of loved everything, but I loved the coaches, loved the school. For me, I wanted to get away from home for college. I want to get that full college experience, kind of living on your own. Mm -hmm. So I had people like, oh, want well, like you can go play for USF right down the street. And to me, that's not what I wanted to do. I didn't want to be right down the road. I wanted to kind of have my space and kind of just get to live life on my own and also live in a new element. So. Growing up in Tampa, all I knew was hot, warm. Yeah, um, sure. I, I wanted to uh, experience something new, and I definitely got that in Syracuse with uh, all that snow that we get up there. Yeah. Uh, what? So being at Syracuse, like I've never been up there, so I've never been to Syracuse. Even I know, like you hear kind of like about these blizzards, snowstorms, whatever you want to call it. You know, I'm from Florida myself, so I never really experienced that either. What was that transition like? Because like you said, you went from down south, like the southernmost state, to, you know, the northeast. What was that, I guess, transition like being in an entirely new environment? I think I really – I actually kind of enjoyed it for a while. Um, it was – it's definitely cool to kind of live in colder weather, I guess, for a couple of years. But definitely towards – I think it's more towards the end of each season. When you start getting to, like – 
even just February or March, you're like, okay, can this all just go away so I can just have mm. warm weather again? But then it also made it great when we went on spring break that I'd come down to Florida and it's like everyone else is still, you know, in Washington, D.C. or Baltimore or somewhere up north, like where they're from originally. And I'm down south, you know, just having fun right. <laughs> in the warm weather and kind of rubbing it in a little bit. So it was, a, it was definitely fun. But after a while, to me, it gets it gets old. It gets old pretty pretty quick. But it's fun to – there's some good snowboarding places around that I kind of went up into there and just did some snowboarding with some friends. So there's some uh, fun stuff that you can definitely do. But I don't know if it's for me anymore. Yeah, no, I understand. Uh, so being at Syracuse, so you got two degrees. Um, one, that's amazing. Like, I wish more athletes understood that if you are – intentional with your coursework and how you maneuver right you can get all both degrees paid for can you i i guess can you touch on that like you graduated in three years i want to say from your undergrad degree and then you got your master's how did you do that while playing ball and looking back why do you think that was such a good decision i guess right. or like why don't more athletes do that so Right now, I'm still working on my master's. All I have left is an internship to get my master's, which I'm going to do, I think, in the spring once football season's kind of out. But really, it all started in high school because in Florida, we have dual enrollment. So I was doing dual enrollment from, I think, my sophomore year of high school. So I was taking college classes at the community college, which count as both high school and college classes then. Mm -hmm. So when I got to Syracuse, I actually transferred in with, I think, 30 credits or right around 30 credits. So awesome. I had basically a full year done. So then while people, while some student athletes are grinding through the year, through like the spring and the fall and they're doing 15 credits or 18 credits, which is just absurd, especially when you're an athlete, I was kind of sitting there with 12 or 13, you know, just kind of taking it easier, I guess, on myself. But then you also have summer classes. So we're there basically year around like it always bugged me when I saw people <laughs> post about oh I miss Syracuse so much I'm just like I've been here the whole time yeah. so yeah. no like stop but um so that's kind of what led to that just getting in three years was you know just coming in already with the credits um and then summer classes and then kind of just make sure you get all your classes done and I've always been really good at kind of look at my schedule and planning things out well in advance to figure out what classes I need and what I want to take and what I need to take and all that. So I did a well lot of that. And for my master's, just kind of picking something because I feel like some people, the reason why they don't finish or finish faster is because they'll go in and they don't really know what they want to do, which is some, somewhat like me. Um, so I wanted to do physical therapy originally. So I was doing health and exercise science with a focus on PT, but I ended up kind of changing it to the generic track at the end because I didn't care about doing PT anymore. Right. But that's one thing I just, I could have changed my major completely, but like this isn't what I want to do, but I was just like, I'm so far into it. Might as well just finish it at this point. Cause a lot of times jobs, they don't really care what you get your degree in. For sure. My yeah. sister does medical sales and she got her degree in criminology. So mm. I don't know how those add up, but a lot of it's just basically what you do and um, kind of how you – like what all you did in college is basically what they want. Did you do sports or, or what did you do? When did you – because I – so I have an agent class now and I was just talking to them about that. Like in my career, people don't care. Like players don't care where you went to school or what you got your degree in. When do you think you realize or have you, I guess, always known – that it's less about the degree, but more about the person with the degree. When did that kind of click for you? I feel like I kind of knew that probably about halfway through high school um, is kind of when I started figuring that out and kind of connecting the dots that like really life, life is all about connections. It doesn't mm. really matter what you, what you have, like what you've done. It's just who you've kind of connected with. So like I have so many people that, you know, when I'm done playing, football I want to do medical sales and I have so many people that either do medical sales that I know that do medical sales or people that like have been like hey like when you're done like let me know I have 
a couple of buddies to do it. So like I have all these connections already set for, you know, in the future, if I want to do medical sales. So it's really just all about making connections and like, obviously don't connect with every single person. You, you don't really, that's not going to help you in the long run. It's connecting with the, like the valuable people who are going to make you better people who are going to add to your small circle of friends. And that's kind of something I learned throughout college too is, or I guess I've kind of always had that mentality of like, I don't really care how many friends I have. Like, mm. I just care about a couple of quality friends. That's all I need. Like I can hang out with the same people over and over again. I'm happy. I don't need to be like jumping from one friend group to the next and having like, Oh, these are all the friends I have. Like I yeah. just let me have my select few friends and let me live life. Can you, it's kind of backtracking. So you were homeschooled for a while. What was, because that's what you, like, I don't know what that's like. That's something me and my wife are talking about right now doing with Roman. Um, can you, I guess, touch on that experience for those that have no idea what that's like? Yeah, so actually, I was technically homeschooled throughout my whole high school. Like, through high school, I was homeschooled technically. So I could have grad, I graduated through Armwood, but I could have graduated as a homeschool student. So luckily in Florida, we have the 10 Tebow rule where mm. they, that's why everyone calls it, where if you're homeschooled, you can still play sports at the local high school. So that's what Tim Tebow did. He played at Nice, but the homeschool, it kind of changes throughout when you are growing up. So like when I first started, it was basically my mom buying, buying teaching books basically, and then teaching it to us. And then as we kind of transitioned towards high school when you get through middle school and kind of get towards the high school um a lot of us we do florida virtual school which is just online school i know a lot of the uh, public school people will do it sometimes too whether it's through the summer or uh even just throughout the year they'll right that's for their schedule so that's something that i did so really my junior and senior year consisted of doing three um community college classes and then I think I did, I did four at Armwood because I went part time to Armwood so I could play football because I was, I was a school choice there. So I kind of transitioned away from homeschool in a sense, but technically I was still considered a homeschool student. Do you think that your mindset of getting your work done, of having valuable friends around, not have, not wanting all of you know, being Mr. Popular with everybody. Do you think that stemmed from being homeschooled? Because it seemed like your parents did a good job of instilling, like, the right values. Do you think that came more so from being more around them and less around negative influences, which happens with a lot of people in school? Or where do you think that kind of comes from, I guess? I think some of it is from, from being homeschooled. I mean, people think homeschoolers don't have, like, social skills because of the fact that you're I've just – I've heard that. Yeah. But – but like for me, like I, we were always around sports. So we were around people like my best friend growing up went to school. And so mm -hmm. I'm around people who kind of went to school all the time. And I was the oddball who was homeschooled. But I was always kind of around people um, from different types of backgrounds and everything, playing football, playing soccer, fo uh, baseball. So I was always around different people. But I think part of it's that I was homeschooled is why I don't really care about socializing with everyone. But I think part of it's too just naturally I'm like an introvert. Like I just I don't mind. I can sit in my room all day, watch T V and just chill and I'm I'm fine with that. Like right. I don't I don't get bothered by that. I can just kind of be by myself for a little bit and just take time to myself and just enjoy myself really. Makes sense. So okay, so you graduated, you got your degree, last year comes, you're all American. You know, that's you are like that's a, a fact. I trust. I tell people that like you know I signed Sterling. He's all American out of Syracuse. I say it proudly. You have had a modest approach to like the honors that have come. You were a Ray Guy Award finalist. Can you I guess talk me through your last year at Syracuse? And although you know the team wasn't doing the best you were having a relatively successful year. Can you, I guess, talk about the emotions of, okay, my team is not, you know, we're not winning to the caliber of what I want. However, my individual performance, like you were doing really well. Can you, I guess, talk about your last year at Syracuse? Yeah, it's always weird 
being a punter in that sense because there are games where, for instance, against Clemson this past year and Clemson the year before, two of my best games ever where I averaged over 50 yards. I don't think I gave up a single punt return or barely gave up any like return yards or anything like that. So, but we end up losing. So it's like heartbreaking because you're like, well, I did, I, basically I did my job, but we didn't win. But I've always been the type of person where like, I honestly don't, like I'd rather perform well, but as long as we win, I don't like, if my job is to punt the ball out of bounds 30 yards every time, and it hurts my individual stat, but we win the game. Like, I don't really, I don't really care. Like, I just want to win football games because that's like the biggest thing in my book is just winning games. So, I've kind of always put like you want to have personal goals so you can help your team out, but in a sense of, I'd rather just win football games and not perform as well, yeah. or kind of. And it's like something like that. Like I'd rather, I'd rather just win football games. Makes sense. Understood. Yeah, for sure. And I even, cause I remember, I think it was the first time we met, uh, and I mentioned it, and you were just kind of like, no, nah, so nonchalant about, <laughs> oh, like it's cool, but it's not the, you know, the end all be all, which I think speaks a lot to your character, cause there are a lot of guys that do get awards, that do do well, and that becomes their identity. So it's definitely refreshing. Uh, for a little background for people, so me and Sterling, so we, I saw a tweet. I'd always kind of followed you, your career throughout college. I knew it was like, okay, I know you're from Arbor. You went to Syracuse. You played really well. I think it was, this was your redshirt junior year. You had a good year. Even I think I want to say your redshirt sophomore as well. Shout out Coach Pete. Coach Pete, if you listen to this, I appreciate you for sure. Uh, we have a GSA swag bag that's in my closet. I still got to get it shipped out. But Coach Peterson had tweeted something about you being an All-American. And then I knew the name, like Hoffrichter. Like, I know he went to Armwood. And this would have been at the end of November, I want to say, of the cycle. So November 2019. And long story short, reached out to Coach Peterson, who was our linebacker coach at Armwood. He got us in contact, talked with your sister, talked with you. We met, great conversation, and you ended up signing with us. For those guys that are in college now that are maybe about to go into the recruiting cycle, trying to pick an agent, whatever it could be, what would be a, maybe a tip for them as they move through the process that you went through to the end of the year? Yeah, so I feel like it's – different for every person like for me personally I wanted to enjoy my last year of college football like I knew college football is just different even if I played in the NFL it's just a different experience so I didn't even want to talk to a single agent throughout my college like season so is that like whenever I got some type of DM or something like that like hey I'm an agent my sister and I we actually did this basic tech like text that I copy and pasted every person like hey I'm just trying to focus mm. on your season you know my sister's taking all business inquiries at the time or something along that lines. And I'd send like her email address because I just, I didn't want to deal with that. Like I didn't, I just wanted to focus on my senior season. Cause really, if you don't have a good senior season, like the biggest thing is game film. So if you don't mm -hmm. do well, you're focusing on the next level, you're not, you're not really going to make it anymore. So mm -hmm. that's one thing for me is that I just, I didn't really, I knew if you're good enough, two agents are going to come to you. You don't have to go searching for agents. So they'll come to you if you're good enough. So that's not something we have to be out there like, oh, middle of the season, I got to start looking for agents. Like, who should I start? Like, to me, that wasn't even a, a stress to me because I felt like there's plenty of time, even for me after the season, to kind of start interviewing the agents. But I had my sister basically interview every single one. Um, for me during the season she kind of put to, like she like talked to me after and be like yeah that guy um uh, probably not I was like okay because yeah. my sister and I were very much alike where we like she gets down to the nitty-gritty and asks, I don't know like we had a we had a sheet too that had kind of basic questions on like um how long they've been agent for and stuff like that just trying to figure out their background and who they've represented and it, you can you can tell a lot by who people, what they say. So if they just start blurting out one person that they represent because it's a big time player, you're like, okay, cool. You like, I don't, that's great. 
at all to say that. But so yeah, my biggest like if you can get a family member to kind of shuffle through them and try to interview them a little bit, come up with a little um, questionnaire basically where you're just asking basic questions. And I mean, for me too, like I think I told you right off the bat, like you're like, oh, like we'll pay for all your training, all that. And I was like, really? Like I'm not. I'm not in it like I'm not asking for an agent for money like I don't yeah. I'm not trying to make money from it like have an agent pay me and that's how I make money I'm trying to basically just be helped to where I can get to the NFL and make money from them so I know a lot of people like kind of go oh this agent's offering me fifteen thousand dollars to use however I want like okay like I don't right. that's not that wasn't my process people think differently so I mean you just gotta figure out I guess what you're what you're looking for in a person. So, um, yeah. No, that's good. Cause that's real. That is one thing that you said is having the family member that you trust that can shuffle things for you. Cause it can, a lot of guys do allow it to overwhelm them, uh, where you can lose track of the task at hand, but also the fact that I told it, like after we had met so many guys, what they want their goal really is to suck as much money as they can out of an agent failing to realize that there's so much more that you really should be worried about but that's a story for another day <laughs> okay so the pre-draft process you know, you went to the nflpa bowl um you went in pasadena you went to the combine and then the virus hits can you, I guess, just discuss the process as a whole, whatever, any – all right, we're back. Uh, let me put this on, do not disturb. Uh, okay. Can you discuss, I guess, how the pre-draft process was for you? Yeah, so it was – I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of work. It seems slow. It seems like it takes forever to get to the NFL draft. And then when you finally get there, you're like, wow, that was four months. It goes mm. really fast in the long run. Um, so I remember sitting. Well, the first one to the NFL PA game out in L.A., which is so much fun. It was my first time out on the West Coast, like the actual West Coast. Because I've been to Hawaii a couple times, but I never actually like, stayed in L.A. So it was, uh, it was really cool to get that, like, experience L.A. a little bit and kind of get to – live out there so but I remember sitting in one of the meetings and I'm sitting there thinking okay like the draft is you know so like we're in January the drafts in April I'm like this is so far away and then they literally say like how many weeks there are and I was like wait there's only that many weeks like then when yeah. you get into weeks you're like that's not a lot of time like really so it was crazy so I remember kind of that's when I kind of got my mind right you know of, this is going to happen quick and you got to kind of make the most of your experience. So I also, that was another thing too, is I just wanted to kind of enjoy the NFL draft process. Like I wasn't sitting there like, Oh, I can't wait for April. Like I was like, okay, let's go each day at a time. Just kind of like enjoy the experience and work hard each day for the experience. So, so I went to LA and I think I came back for a little bit to Syracuse because I still had classes during the spring. Um, which I was told by a bunch of people not to do, but <laughs> I still, still made it through. Um, and then I ended up going out to Arizona for a week to do some training out there and then back to Syracuse and then, um, you know, just training with – because for kickers, no really specific training sites to kind of really go to. Like, you don't have to put on 20 pounds. You don't have to kind of improve your squat or, like, your bench press or anything like that for – for the combine or for pro day. So the biggest thing for me was just kicking. So um, I was just kind of working with the strength staff at Syracuse because they did a great job over the past four years already. So I was like, okay, let's just train here. And so I ended up going to the, to the NFL combine, which was. How was that experience? It was, it was crazy. It was, it's crazy to just even be there with, with all like the best athletes in the world. So you're sitting there yeah. and you're like, Hey, there's Joe Burrow. There's CD Lamb. Yeah. Like doesn't make sense, but it was a, it was definitely a cool experience to kind of be there. You get there. People think it's all fun though, but it's, it's a long day. You're waking up 7am. You got 
so much medical stuff. Um, we were at the hospital for like three hours at least. I know some people spend all day there doing stuff like MRIs, x-rays, um, DEXA scans, literally just anything you can imagine. Yeah. They, they're about to invest so much money into you that they want to know every little thing about you to make sure that you're worth their investment. So it was a long week, but then we finally got to the last day and all I did was go out there and kick at 11 o'clock and that was my day. Yeah. So I didn't really, I didn't do any of the 40 vert, anything like that because I just, it doesn't, it's not going to help me. So what was the point of kind of doing that and possibly risking injury for some reason? So, um, of course, then after the combine, you're sitting there thinking, you know, we saw pro day. So uh, I went back to Syracuse, start training for that. And then that's kind of when coronavirus started to be end to hit was right around the beginning of March, I want to say. Mm -hmm. like, yep. So my, my pro day was supposed to be right after spring break, um, March 22nd or 23rd. So we actually went home for spring break and we were told that uh, we're not coming back to school at all. So then pro day got canceled. So then from there, it's just kind of try and do as much as you can. So I try to get a virtual pro day in, but all the fields here kind of got shut down and then don't really have a long snapper because I plan for my long snapper to come back to Syracuse. Like one well, of my old long snappers come back to Syracuse and snaps me and all that. So um, kind of missed out on some of that, but you know, everything happens for a reason. So I just kind of was like, you know, like it's, if it's not in my control, I don't, I don't really worry about it. So one of my, my first coach at Syracuse said, like one of his famous things is control the controllables. Mm. So I don't stress about things I can't control because it's not going to do me any good. So. Pointless. Yeah. So you get to draft weekend. What was, I guess, Watching the draft, what is that like? Obviously, the Falcons were, you know, a team that you were high on. It seemed like they were high on you going into the draft. I guess walk me through the draft weekend, getting the call. I ended up being with the Falcons. Like, one thing I talked about this, I think, on the episode before, is you have a lot of teams that will hype up players, a lot of teams that will make it seem like they have some genuine interest, and then they don't come through in anything. But ATL was, like, very consistent, you know, very, like, shout out Ben. Um, what was that draft process like, like the weekend, the call, all of that? Kind of talk me through that. Yeah, so I think it was actually the first draft I ever watched, basically from beginning to end. Because Did you watch You watch every, like, I watched finish. Thursday night, I watched Friday night, yeah. and then I, I watched all day Saturday until I got drafted and got thrown into the pool. And, hmm. yeah, but – so it was like first time I actually watched like the entire draft because there's there's no there's no nothing else on TV no other sports because usually it's like basketball or hockey so I just kind of watch one of those but uh, the draft it was uh, I don't know it's just like one of those crazy experiences so I had my family and friends over and it's just kind of like a small little party thing because of coronavirus so I wasn't gonna have a lot of people over or anything like that so obviously like you said we had. Atlanta was kind of really big on me. So, you know, we kind of – a lot of the teams that kind of talked to us, we scattered out what picks they had later in the round – like late, later in rounds because that's when punters usually get drafted. So we kind of scattered all that out and tried to figure out, you know, where I could possibly go and all that. But then – so around pick 200, I got a – so the Falcons are 228 around 200. I got a call from coach Ben and just kind of saying that he, did, he wasn't really sure if they're going to draft me or not because, you know, there's higher powers than him. They have other people they want to get. So it's really not up to him too much, but he's like, he's just telling me like, Hey, if we don't, like, I really want you to come to Atlanta. Like I want, I want you to be our guy. And I want you to like, we get you in free agency that's great if we draft you, it's great. But I just want you to know that, like, we want you at, in Atlanta, which right. um, basically from that point, from well, I think a couple of days before, I was pretty much set that I was going to be going to Atlanta because of how consistent and how much they talked to me and everything like that. So well, You had talked with Dan Quinn, too, um, yep. head coach on the phone and whatnot. Okay. Yeah, talked to Coach Quinn, talked to Coach Ben a lot, and then talked to some scouting um, recruiters and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So. They were the biggest team on me. Um, 
So then, but 200, he called me and then we kind of hang up and, you know, from 200, 228 was probably the longest <laughs> time ever. Yeah. I'm sitting there, I'm like, great. I'm like, what is, like, I don't know what this means. Like, cause you sit there and like before the draft, you're like, okay, like, like I'm, I'm pretty optimistic, but I'm also realistic. So like, I'm like, okay, there's a high chance I could get drafted. But then it's like, well, also, I don't, like, I don't know. Like, I'm not going to be like, I'm going to get drafted and not get drafted and be, like, in a hole. So I'm going to rather be, like, maybe I won't get drafted and I get drafted. It's, like, even better. So pick 228. Literally, I think as soon as the TV showed 228, I got a phone call. And I don't remember what the number was. I'm sure it was Atlanta, Georgia, or something. Yeah. But, um, so I got a phone call, and, you know, they just told me that they're going to pick me with this pick. And so I talked to – uh, Coach Ben again, Coach Quinn, Arthur Blank, the owner, mm. and then um, TD, the general manager. So kind of went around playing phone tag in a sense of talking to all different people because they're all virtual. So it's like different. Right. They're in different locations. <clears throat> so um, it was it was the craziest um, phone call probably of my what, life. What is that like? Like when it, the phone rings and you know Atlanta's pick is next. What was that moment like for you? I think it was I think I was just in shock. I was like, this is this is really happening. Like you're mm-hmm. sitting there and you're like, okay, like it could really happen. But then like when it actually happens, you're just like, holy crap, like it's actually happening. Yeah. I remember I think you called me after and you're like, Yeah, they said you didn't sound too excited. I was like, Dude, I'm <laughs> yeah, that's shocked. what they said. I'm like, I'm in shock over it. Like it's just it's just it's like real. Crazy. Yeah. Cause it's like been a dream line for so long to be you know drafted and then finally get drafted is just like that's it's crazy so yeah. it was uh after that I ended up uh popping some champagne got tossed in the pool and uh I know I didn't I didn't really text many people back until later that night because I was you know just trying to enjoy the time with my family and just the people yeah. who were like right there people who have been there from like the very beginning you know just trying to mm. I enjoy my time and because I had my phone on me for the whole day and I was like you know what like turn it off throw yeah. it right to the side just kind of I don't know enjoy the day enjoy the moments that being caught up on social media on texting people back just like sitting and enjoying the moment so that's what's up um so after the draft like what was that time like like with your fan like what was their reaction like their response I guess like, how were they seeming? Obviously excited, you know. Yeah, I think my sister – I think my sister blew out my eardrums for a little bit because she was screaming so loud. <laughs> like, but, no, we were all uh, super excited. And, I mean, we had we had a fun whole day. You know, we had, like, a bunch of different foods out. We had dip and, like, mm. chips and dip and just, you know, kind of just enjoying the day throughout the whole time. And then at the end, just popping champagne and just kind of celebrating. When was the moment where, I guess, like, the shock kind of went away and it really hit you like, I'm an Atlanta Falcon? I'd say it probably took – it probably took a little bit. I don't know if – I feel like I – I feel like it set in a little bit, probably after I did some Atlanta Falcons media that I was like, mm. it's actually, like, real. But then, like, so that whole day I kind of just enjoyed the moment. And then I feel like – when I woke up the next morning, I kind of, like, flipped the switch. and was like, okay, like, that's great that happened, but it's time, like, go back to work. And, like, yeah, because you can't just sit there and just be celebrating for days. It's just you got to get over and kind of move on and, and look at getting better and, like, proving that, you know, they made a good choice. Mm, that's real. So now that you're, you know, you're on, you're on a team, you have been having these virtual meetings, what is your mindset moving forward? Obviously, we don't – there's not a concrete idea yet of what the future looks like. But what is your mindset now going into – because there will be a camp, uh, assuming there will be a training camp. What is your mentality moving forward these next few weeks? I'd say really just continuing getting better and kind of refining my craft and just kind of getting – Getting as ready as possible. It's, we, like you said, we have no idea. I haven't heard really anything concrete on when we're supposed to go or anything like that. So, still just trying to – everything's just up in the air. But um, 
I think once I think really like once the other sports get started, like MLB, they were supposed to start in the spring and they haven't even started yet. So I think once those other sports kind of start, the NFL will look at it will really be kind of set on what they're gonna do. So um just really continuing to train and then I'm going up to Atlanta to get some working with my snapper and kicker and just kind of start building that relationship now. And then coming back to Florida and continuing to work. Yeah, cool. Last few questions for you, Roy. Uh, so, you know, right now you've taken your next step. You know, the, the vision is not crystallized yet, but you've taken a step. What would be, I guess, looking back maybe to a freshman that is just about to step on campus, what would be one tip that you would give to that individual that maybe you wish somebody had told you or a lesson that you learned through college that you wish somebody would have said, what would be that one tangible piece of advice that you would want to give to somebody that sees where you are and is like, that's where I'm trying to go? There's so much advice to give, but I guess the biggest thing, so one thing I kind of learned my very first, I think it was my very first practice that I was there because I was behind Riley. Um, so I was kind of, for me as a punter, I was swinging for the fences trying to, you know, match his best ball as a freshman going against a senior instead of – he ended up telling me, he's like, dude, just swing nice and easy and just let the ball do the work. So yeah. I guess the biggest advice would be kind of take little changes, but a lot of things that you do now, if it's not, like, extreme, like you can you can still keep it. Like, everyone's different. So don't don't look at – one person's form and be like, I want to be just like him. So like what I've done through my whole career is kind of looked at a bunch of different NFL punters. So really people who have been in the league for a long time, like Brett Kern, uh, Thomas Morstead, you know, guys who have been in the league for 10 plus years. I mean, obviously they're doing something right. So I'd watch their film and kind of pick a couple things from them that I want to replicate and kind of add it to my own form. So what you try to do is become – a form of a bunch of different people who are doing things correct. Because each guy in the NFL, they have their downfalls too. They have something that mm-hmm. they, that's not perfect. So really it's kind of figuring out what each person does that they do really well at and kind of ending up copying that and just trying to be the best that you can be. Because for me, I'm 5'9", which is super short for a punter. I'm right. in the NFL or six foot or taller. So I mean, I know I had people who kind of doubted me as a punter because I was so I was short, but in the end, at the end of the day, it's kind of what you put in that will get you where you want to be. So I mean, I never really cared what people said about me or thought, or I mean, I guess I did to a sense of using it as fuel to be like, watch up or be wrong, but nothing of like, oh, you're right, I can't, like, I don't, I really don't care what people say. That's good. Okay, on the flip side, then. You know, say it's year 2020, we fast forward, say it's we're 20 years from now, it's 2040, you've had a successful NFL career, you've started on whatever your second career is, whatever that looks like. Who is Sterling Hoffrichter 20 years from now? Like, who is that man? What is he like? It's a great question. Um, I feel like overall, I just want to kind of, I mean, be – I don't like I want to be someone who kind of gives back to the community community as much as possible. So that's something that the Atlanta Falcons do really well that Arthur Blank does really well is he loves to give back to the people of Atlanta. Um, so I feel like it's kind of like a perfect situation I'm in right now that I'm in an organization that really cares about the people in the city, like mm. the people that we're playing for that we kind of represent on, you know, like a national level in the sense that we're playing for the people of Atlanta and like stuff like that. So I feel like I'm in the perfect spot right now of kind of where I should be for an owner that really cares about the people, a, a team and organization that really kind of cares about the city and kind of want to make, you know, Atlanta, I guess, well known, like even more and kind of show that like what type of people that Atlanta are. That's what's up. Okay. Before I ask the last question, where can people listening follow you on social? Yeah, so I think my, my Instagram is just Sterling Hoffrichter. 
And I think my Twitter is shoffer10, which I probably should change that because I'm number four, but yeah. uh, maybe, maybe later I'll change that. Yeah, for sure. Okay, last question I got for you. So you've done these great things. You know, you're all American. You got drafted. You're about to be in the world. You're technically you're in the league already. What in this time is one thing that you are grateful for? Um, really, I guess I'd say I'm grateful for like my health and like my family's health because obviously with coronavirus first, just kind of um, a lot of people are kind of really you know scared about because it it's the disease that no one knew about. It's where like I feel like it's the biggest thing that was a problem with coronavirus that no one knew anything about it. So we didn't know how it was going to react. You know how many people it's going to take out or anything like that. So that's one thing that like no one really knew about. So I think really just overall the health of my, like my close friends and family, um, you know, all doing well, it's probably the biggest thing that you can kind of, kind of ask for just for everyone that you, that you know, personally that you have close relationships with that they're just, you know, healthy and, and doing well, like in this crazy time. Yeah, for sure. Okay. That's dope. You got anything else that you want to touch on? Or are you good? I think I'm good. All right. Uh, uh, long interview. Yeah, long. Well, 40 something minutes. Hey, I got questions now. I can ask the <laughs> questions. Um, but, Sterling, I appreciate you, man. Appreciate your time for sure. Anybody that might be listening, check them out. Uh, he'll be booming some punts in a stadium near you coming soon. But, Sterling, appreciate your time, man. And aside from that, we out. All right. Thank you. All right. We should be good. All right. All right, bro. Uh, you good? Otherwise? Yeah, I'm doing well. I go get this, uh, get this kick again, and uh, do more meetings. Yeah. <laughs> what time's your next meeting? You said you're saying. Uh